Hi everyone, welcome to our masterclass, A Small Business Guide to Buying and Selling a Business. I'm Seth Busby, editor of Koshy's Business Builders, and I'm absolutely delighted to have you joining me today. We're broadcasting to you live from our studios at International Towers in Barangaroo, but before we dive into the nitty gritty of this event, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land we meet today, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Now, joining me as our expert today is Kobe Simat. Kobe's a brilliant business strategist. He's the author of the fantastic book, How to Build a Business Others Want to Buy, and he's been helping countless entrepreneurs navigate the maze of buying and selling businesses for decades. He's here to share his invaluable insights and practical strategies that will hopefully help you make smarter decisions on your entrepreneurial journey. Kobe, welcome. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Now, so you're one of Australia's leading business advisors. You've spent over 25 years helping businesses and individuals thrive and build better businesses. You have clients all over the globe. You consult across all different business sectors. But where did that all begin? Where, where did your passion for business come from? Yeah, look, um, uh, I guess it starts when I was 15 years old and I found myself homeless. Um, my, f my father's business failed and you know, I'll cut a very long story short. Um, and so I've lived every day since that day with the fear of business failure, if you like. So I guess in, in, in going the pendulum swinging in the completely opposite direction, um, looking at you know, how can businesses be better, how can they survive? Because they are the life, particularly small, small business is the lifeblood backbone of any economy, particularly the Australian economy. So you know, if you look at there's two to two and a half million, depending on the time they run the, the data, registered businesses submitting a bad statement, for example. And so when you look at that and you look at the numbers, then you overlay that with say, small business administration data and they talk about that, you know, the average business lasts maybe less than 12 months. So 50% of businesses might fail in the first 12 months. Um, and then we start looking at, you know, varying levels of success, but less than half of 1% of businesses ever meet their financial goals at the 10 year period. So my passion starts when I'm 15 um, to kind of say, well, what can I do? I've, I followed in the footsteps of my father who was an entrepreneur. Um, I didn't have a parent that was an example of like kind of going and earning a wage and going to work. Yeah. And so all I could really do was follow the example of my parents, which was to start and run a business. Um, my brother did that. Um, my sister has um, managed to get into uh, you know, full-time employment um, and she's obviously a, a great mother. She got three kids, but um, you know, in terms of what my brother and I have both done is gone separately and started businesses, um, you know, following our parents. So, so I think that what I have become over the years is very passionate because I've seen how you can succeed um, and that some of the really basic, simple, fundamental mistakes that people make along the way mm. um, and learning to, you know, to obviously get around those and then consequently now try to educate as many people as possible on you know, the simple things to avoid so that you can succeed. Yeah, so there are some common pitfalls, aren't there? That, like people start a business and they don't necessarily have the knowledge that they need to run a business. They just have a passion and a great idea. What, what are some, some things that you see businesses making mistakes at from yeah. the get-go? Look, I, I think the first thing is, the, is, um, is to kind of, you know, and I wanted to, to come today and kind of talk about some really practical things. I think it's really about, am I owning and running a business and, and let's also use owning and running an investment, or am I a technician? And most people are very good at something very simple and, and a, you know, or, or their, their task, and I'd probably oversimplify it, they could be an engineer or a doctor or a brain surgeon or a, an ethicist or somebody who's passionate about grooming dogs, you know, or, or, a, you know, or a hairdresser or a makeup artist or whatever that might be. And they're very good at something very technical that there is a need in the community for, and they turn that, that they start to kind of earn some income but then that becomes self-employed and then they say, actually, I'm, you know, am I self-employed or do I own a business, if that makes sense? And so the first mistake we make is that we, you know, I'm the best at what I do, I need to do the technical thing, but in actual fact, you're the operator of the business mm. and really, you know, don't fall into the trap that you need to be that person doing that technical thing very well, because the only reason you can is because you've had a lot of practice. Yeah. So give your team members or the people that come to join you lots of practice and practice means making mistakes so you create a safe environment because you can jump in and help them solve the problem or avoid disaster and teach people to be great technicians and then learn to be a great leader and run your business yeah divest your knowledge to other people because how Absolutely. can you grow your business if you're 
holding on to all the knowledge yourself. That's it, 100%. Yeah, because <laughs> all you'll have time for is to do that thing that you're great Absolutely. at. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Now, now, you've done a little prezzo for yes. us. Yes, yes. Um, and you're happy to take questions throughout as well. Yep. So if people have anything as, as Kobe's going through his presentation, if you want to shout out your questions. Otherwise, we'll have plenty of time for questions afterwards. So, yeah, Kobe, do you, do you want to Yeah, absolutely. I've got, um, I've got some slides for you guys. So, um, we'll, we'll kind of get in that. And that's a prompt to run the discussion. But I really want to start um, my session today with a question for you guys in the audience. And, and don't answer it right now, but, but think about it as we go. And, th and that question's an open one, which is, if you could get inside my head and ask me any question... What would that be? And nothing's off limits. And we've got some people moderating the chat and the comments, and so we can I can answer those. So please, you know, if something comes to mind that I touch on something or it's interesting as I go through this presentation, please jump in and hit it, and um, and, and we'll get to it um, as best we can as they come through. So super important. And and so then I want you to write that question down, which is, if you could get inside my head and ask me any question, what would that be? Because that is going to be something that I'm going to encourage you to use with your own team members and the, whether they're outsource people helping you in your business, whether you've got staff, whether you've got volunteers, whether you've got employees, uh, family members, if you like, the people around you, because businesses, you know, there's no I in the word business. Um, it, it is all about teams and it's all about the different people that are around you, even if it's simply you by yourself and your accountant, for example, um, who you might only see a couple of times a year. Um, think about that. So that question is really good as you empower your team members to kind of, you know, have the questions that they have answered but you've got to prompt it and bring it out of them. Um, one thing I'm going to do is quickly just start with my why, which is this, uh, this first slide I've got here, which is what I'm super passionate about. I'm super passionate about empowering your company and you on, uh, on your journey to success and helping you navigate that. That's my why, if you like, that's my purpose. So I've taken a lot of time over the last 18 months to write an amazing book and I'll, I'll talk about that shortly. Um, but that's really about you know, whether I'm partnering with my team members, whether I'm partnering with you, your team members, you know, in terms of what we're, um, you know, we're doing with these presentations, that's definitely something that you know, guides everything I do. So everything that I've got today really comes back to that point and we can have some fun with the how and the what we do along that journey as we go. So, um, okay, um, I do um, spend a fair bit of time in a uh, coaching slash consulting and business advisory company. I'm gonna talk about my history briefly uh, shortly, but um, our organization is called Next Practice. Uh, you can go to mynextpractice.com is the website. And really we're, we're super passionate about partnering with you to navigate your journey to business success. And we can you know, do that in a, a bunch of great ways, but fundamentally, we're there to create great companies that are great to work at for everybody involved in the team. And that's the first stakeholder that we focus on. Great to buy from, and that's focusing on your customers and the people that you're doing business with for fair commercial exchange. And then obviously that entity, organization, company, whatever it might be, becomes a great investment and it's great to invest in. And it's, they're very specifically chosen and placed in that order that we're working with three key stakeholders. The first stakeholder we're working with has got to be a great place to work at because it's super hard, uh, even, even more so in the current economic climate, to find great people. Mm. And so, I've already got a question. Sorry, excellent. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I've got someone called Ivor or Ivor. I'm sorry, I'm probably butchering your name. But um, it is, I'm a one-man business. I'm told that is why I can't sell my business, which is 38 years old. Is this really the case? Are sole trader businesses not sellable? No, 100%. You'll find a buyer for that business. Um, we need to look at what the value is. So if you were an investor, um, say, for example, you know, let's, let's just pick an arbitrary number out of thin air, $100,000. Uh, you're a one-man sole trader, uh, sole operator business. Let's say, for example, uh, $100,000 is a, is a price tag. Maybe it's a million, but let's use 100,000 round figures. You sell your business, two years down the track, you're sold, you've got the money in the bank and the buyer has that business. Um, they've got to exchange $100,000 with you. So it ends, goes from their bank account to your bank account. The first question for you is what are you going to invest it in? So you're going to maybe spend it all on something, buy a new car and it's all gone and you'll go on to something else to earn an income. Um, but that person's got $100,000 in the, in the bank account right now. Are they looking for a job? Are they looking for your customers? Are they looking for a unique product or service that you sell? Um, we need to ask a question about what they're looking for, but absolutely every single business has a value. 
Uh, one of the biggest challenges in the private equity world right now is, is seller expectations in terms of price. Um, social media is not helping with uh, the discussions about unicorns like Canva and you know, what's going on with Facebook and you know, Instagram and Twitter and all of you know, the, the you know, Atlassian. Um, you know, the buying and selling of companies, you know, um, some, a company I'm very close to yesterday, uh, you know, had a shareholder meeting to decide to privatise a company and sell. Um, so it's a, it's a buyout. Uh, so Japanese companies bought out a local vitamin company. Um, you can Google and find out who that is. Um, and so every single business has got a value. It just comes down to like your product and service has a value. What is someone prepared to pay for that? So um, it's much harder to sell a business that is run by one person and that mm. person's gonna leave. And so you really gotta say, well, what am I selling? Are you selling the mobile phone that's full of contacts? Are you selling something that's unique, um, you know, product or service? And then we, you, know, you can spend some time, and I'm not a business broker, uh, but you can, you can spend some time either with a broker or with someone like myself to actually say, okay, well, who would be the perfect buyer for this business? Mm. Someone looking for a job, for example. And they may not, that person that's looking to buy your business may not actually have $100,000 in the bank but they might be able to take over and run your business and pay you out over one or two or three yeah. or four or five years' time. So it would be a, a, a seller-funded transaction, if that makes sense. So you get to keep all the profit, they get the business, and then you have the final exchange, you know, two, three, four, five years down the track. Yeah, because selling a business doesn't necessarily mean handing everything over. 100%. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so um, keep coming with the questions um, as we go through the presentation. So uh, kind of back to my point there in terms of what I'm focused on is, is and, and that's a great question actually, because if we work to create a company that is great to work at, um, most people that are individuals that I spend time with are like, it's too hard to find great people. Um, so on a scale of zero to 10, I would suggest rating yourself as a leader. Are you a zero, you know, bad, 10 good, because if you're a 10 in business as a leader, people are going to be banging on the door to work for you for free. And so it will be easy to filter through the queue of people that are coming to the door and you go, you know, you don't even have to go to the market and advertise because there's already people queued up saying, I don't care what it costs me, I want to work for you. And in fact, I know people who charge people for internships. People pay money, like real money and lots of it, to go to work for them. So that, that internship process is not just interns working for free or being paid. I thought paid. that was no longer legal. It's not in this country. It's not in this country. <laughs> However, um, as, as a training and apprenticeship, um, you know, they, they, they package it up as a training course, but you get exclusive time with these people. You get to learn everything. It's, you know, it's well-rounded and, and it's, not, it's not packaged as an internship. But I'm just saying that even if it's legal or not legal, we have people saying, I want to spend time with you and I'm prepared to pay to do that. Mm. So... My point here is, is for people who, if you have a complaint that it's too hard to find great people, on a scale of zero to 10, you've got to start pushing yourself up that scale to be somebody who is amazing to be around, is great at teaching and, um, and empowering team members so that you will have that queue of people queuing up at your door. So that's one of the things, obviously, a great company to work at, buy from, and obviously invest in. So um, I'm conscious of everybody's time, so, um, and I want more questions, so um, I'll, I'll get through a few, few kind of prompting slides as we go. Um, I think it's important to quickly talk about my background, um, certainly the, you know, my modern history, if you like, rather than uh, a long ago in my past, and that is that the, for the last 20 years, I've been leading a company of business advisors. Uh, we got to 70 uh, people, you know, charging around Australia initially, and then we expanded globally, doing business assessments, looking at, look, you know, looking for opportunities for improvement, looking at uh, risk management, looking at, um, you know, product innovation, process innovation, service innovation. Uh, we started uh, using uh, the international standards for business management, like quality assurance or OHS or sustainability or cybersecurity risk management frameworks as a core business, and then we. We've um, springboarded off that into more consulting and advisory services as we've moved on. So uh, we've worked with, uh, you know, in excess of um, 100,000 businesses over the last 25 years. We would look at doing anything from, you know, nowadays bigger assessments, um, you know, with, with probably something in the vicinity of about three to 5,000 companies per annum. Um, I've got some data that I will bring up in the slides uh, coming, but I guess what I wanted to do was Two things have happened. I've done a lot of advisory work over the last couple of years, but I also was running my own business and I made lots of the mistakes that my clients were making. And so 
about three years ago, I decided, you know what, I need a book um, or, or a manual, if you like, that I can start to give to A, my business advisors with the, you know, the gold nuggets that we've picked up over the years, but also for my own managers and my own management team as we grew that organisation to kind of say, you know, here's the manual, here's the Bible, if you like. Yeah, for our so business. documenting processes. Absolutely. So, so I, wrote, um, I, I wrote a book. Um, which is this one here on the screen, which is how to build a business others want to buy. And it started as a manuscript for how to build a business. Mm. Um, and so then, you know, the, uh, Wiley came on board and helped us with the project and they're the publishers um, and, and doing the global distribution of the book, which is super exciting. Um, but in the context of putting that together, I, I was able to kind of distill down, and it was hard to keep it down to 365 pages, <laughs> um, uh, all of the gold nuggets that I picked up, and it's kind of the book that I would have loved to have had when I was, you know, 25 years old thinking about starting my mm. business. So I've got loads more questions go ahead. that have come go through. Ahead. Um, so Julia is asking, is it possible to sell the potential of a business if I have an amazing I, amazing patent and product that with the right distribution could be a global success? How do you sell a small business with a great idea to the right buyer? Um, so, you, well, you start by being very good at selling. So how the, the, if, we, if we broke down a few steps and we said, you know, the question is, you know, how can we sell the, the idea or the potential, if you like? Um, it starts with a pitch. So, th look, there are people out there that will do angel investment. Um, so you would be looking for an angel investor, um, somebody who sees the potential in that. But if you start to look at who, and you've, like any business, any product, any service, you've got to refine your avatar, and I hope I'm not jumping ahead for people listening, that there, there is a target market or a target person, target mm. customer for every product and service. And so if you're selling the potential of an idea, you've got to refine right down and get very narrow on exactly the kind of person that would be able to um, you know, extrapolate the potential out of that idea. It, I won't... Let, don't let me um, uh, tell you otherwise, it's very difficult to sell ideas. Um, we all have thousands of ideas every day and a lot of entrepreneurial people who have got the capacity to execute and deliver the value from that idea will already have lots of ideas. So I'm not gonna say it's easy, but it's possible. Mm. And it's possible by getting very narrow on the focal point of A, who's got the money to spend, more than likely you would be looking at um, somebody who's got the, the other part of the engine room. They've mm. got the people, the processes, the money, the business already set up and you would be um, you know, siphoning that, um, that idea into a, an existing like structure. Like innovating around an existing idea. Perhaps. Exactly right. Um, so to make it easier for yourself, go and get a sale with your very first customer. And so I know that's going to sound hard. I don't have the money to build my product. I don't have, you know, the distribution, whatever that might be. It's important to get the very first sale. And it's very important to get so that you can, when you're pitching your idea, you can say, I've already got $1 of revenue, which means that a customer has exchanged real money for that idea. Now, whether you can prototype it, whether you can sell the idea to a customer, I would always recommend if you've got an idea that you want to sell, sell it to a customer first and get them to prepay. Mm -hmm and then say to someone, I need money to make my product, I already sold it to somebody. You will get investors' attention. Mm. I've got another question which is very practical about how from Liz, she's asking, how do you get your business valued? That's a great question. <laughs> That's an excellent question. Um, I would suggest that there's a number of ways of getting your business valued. Um, there are the straightforward, the, the most common person that is asked that question is an accountant. Accountants typically are very skilled at tax, um, and, and particularly in Australia, in this, this country here where we're broadcasting from, um, more often than not, accountants are skilled experts in tax and tax management. Not the right person to ask for company valuation. Um, the best person to ask for company valuation is yourself to learn essential models and, and essential models of how a business might be valued. But the nuts and bolts of it is when someone's buying a business, what are they actually buying? they're buying future profit. The, the, the whole goal of this game is very simple. It's not rocket science, it's about making profit. And so when we're talking about making profit, we need to turn around and say, okay, what's that gonna be from? Is it gonna be because my idea, product, service gets attached to something else mm. so they can make more profit? Or I make, I've got a business running that makes profit mm. and they go, I just wanna buy your profit. And so then it's really simple to value because we come back to, okay, how long is this business gonna run for with or without you involved, and just back how much to money. Ivor's it comes thing back at the very to it. beginning. Hundred <laughs> percent, absolutely. It, it does come back to 
literally interest. So it comes back to, does this, if I take $100,000 and I invest it in the business, you know, or a million dollars and invest in the business, what percentage return will I get per annum by attaching it to another business or this business? And it will go from anywhere from, you know, from say 15 to 30% return. And obviously the higher percents means the business value is lower. The lower percents means the business value is higher. And so, you know, if you hear about people say getting a multiple of 10 times profit, that's a very stable, sustainable business with predictable revenue and predictable profit. But if a business is like one times profit or half times profit or two times profit, it's maybe only predictable for a short period, maybe a year or two years, like a business that does projects, like a construction company, for example. Yeah. Um, but an accountancy practice, for example, if they're good with their customers in a good bedside manner, might get three times profit, for example. Mm. What's a 10 times profit business? 10 times profit business is something that has a recurring revenue something that has a customer that is coming back and paying yeah. like a, set a subscription amount of money. model like a subscription 100% a subscription model in my book we talk about i think there's about 10 or 20 examples of subscription based businesses mm. um, i've got a really fun one to quickly talk about is through the covid boom lots of families young families like mine went and got dogs yeah um, and lots of them are are a type of oodle a cavoodle, a poodle, a gazoodle or whatever it might be <laughs> a labradoodle a labradoodle <laughs> those dogs all need to be groomed monthly. And our little black and white fluffy thing that sleeps on the bed every night, he goes to the groomer once a month and it's $100. Now that is, now we are struggling. That is a cheap groomer, I need that number. <laughs> yes, yeah, he's only little, <laughs> tiny. But, um, but when you think about gro dog grooming, is that's recurring. And so we're constantly, you know, we've, we've been going to one groomer for like 18 months and then we moved to the next one just because they were like a struggle to deal with. If somebody could nail dog grooming services for the oodles out there, and that's all you need to focus on is one dog breed and then getting people to sign up, I would pay you two or three or four years in advance to lock my appointment that you don't shift it. And I would pay that in advance for the next five years because this little thing's gonna be around for at least a dozen years. We love him very dear, dearly and he gets pampered. And so as a subscription business, that's the kind of business that would be worth 10 times profit. Yeah, so if you're looking for an idea, that's a great yep. one there. Yep. You don't need some crazy tech star. I already have a customer, there you which go. is You've what he it. said you 100%. needed. Yep. I'll give you the money today. You don't, and and that'll, that'll be the bond that you need to pay on your premises when you need to go rent it. Um, I also have a question from Peter. He's asking, how do you make the big leap from entrepreneur to building a team? It can be daunting taking on that extra payroll. I think um, there's a lot I'm, more than I'm really glad you asked, well. actually. <laughs> um, I'm really glad you asked. Um, I've actually got um, a, a slide here, which maybe the team could pop up while I answer this question. So how do we make the leap from being an entrepreneur and, and be, to being a business leader? I think the first thing is to acknowledge that you need to make that leap. So well done on, on asking that question. And starting to, first and foremost, I think, educate yourself. Um, so there's there's... I like to think that there's kind of three legs to this stool, if you like, in terms of making this leap. The first one is the confidence to do it. Um, and so confidence comes with kind of knowing what you need to do and working out you can take a couple of baby steps and, and you know, whatever you might need or, or pumping yourself up with 10 cups of coffee in the morning, whatever it is, that you, or, or a beer, yeah. um, you know, whatever you need to do to kind of make <laughs> a, yourself a confident. A beer in the morning. A beer in the morning. Look, you know, <laughs> it's hardcore. It's, it's five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> um, you know, it's uh, so... But, but I think confidence is the first pillar. The second pillar is, is competence, and competence is only gonna come with practice. Um, and then the other peer, you know, the other leg to the stool is obviously knowledge uh, and awareness, if you like. So you can start by you know, walking into your local bookstore and for $30, there's, there is gold nuggets everywhere in, in the business section. And maybe picking up Simon Sinek, Start With Why, um, is, is the number one book that I recommend that every single person who is running, leading, working in a business needs to read. Um, I buy them like in the truckload to give to people. I, I scour eBay looking for secondhand copies. You know, I go through every bookstore. I pull them out of, you know, street side libraries. You know, you can get them secondhand for $2. Um, I, think, I think that when we start to look at, you know, the, the, how do we make that leap from entrepreneur to business leader, I think you've got to be, be self-educating. Um, and it's got to be with a robust learning medium like books and reading, for mm. example. But what about that practical side of things where he's talking about, you know, yep. the worry of taking on yep. the extra yep. payroll? 100%. It's all right to be, 
in a business and yeah <laughs> yeah so so i think i'm going to quickly fly through these points that are that are up on the slide i guess acknowledging that you've got um, some sales and revenue challenges you've got to be focusing on profitability you've got to be sourcing amazing talent you've got to you know deal with ever increasing compliance requirements you've got to deal with innovation exploding data collection points you know moving customer expectations um, if you're on a mobile device screenshot this right now uh, or if you're on a desktop device screenshot this slide right now that you, you know if you're or watching maybe you can share the slide yeah, deck with us afterwards 100 percent. yes yep. yeah i'll leave you with the slide deck so and don't forget i think we're recording and you can come back to this timestamp in the video and 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 watch this um, again in the webinar uh, exploding social media and internet brand management and team capability so you go from being that technician we talked about earlier mm. out to being a manager plus you need to be a leader yeah so if i jump to the next slide your team has a set of expectations so so i think like doing this webinar right now is one of the best things you can be doing right now because I'm educating you on hygiene factors from um, Frederick Hertzberg's theory, which is there are two parts. And, and if you've ever been in a situation where I kind of hired somebody and they didn't work out or they weren't great or I'm sick of getting apprentices and they never work out or you know the, the young generation of millennials or the next one below millennials, I forget the name of that generation right now, um, they're really nearly impossible to work with and I just can't find great people. What Frederick Hertzberg did in his two-factor theory, he said, was there's really two key parts as a leader that we need to manage, and this is really theoretical for a moment, is that we've got hygiene factors first and foremost on the right-hand side there, which is policy, policies and administrative support. As a small business, we often just kind of working out of the entrepreneur's head. And so as we start to build a business, we literally, you could almost see that you could see the policies piling up as we build this building of, I hate to say that, paperwork, um, but in terms of things to read and so that you've got something that you can use to induct people and train people and guide them on what they need to do. Um, I, I recently joined a, a new board position and I was given an induction pack, the very first board I've ever joined where I was given a proper robust induction pack. Yeah. And so even as a director on a board, um, you know, that, that's been a great way for that business to induct me into that process. Um, and so hygiene factors is you must, and this is mandatory, this list on the right hand side, have policies and administrative support, uh, mentoring, uh, professional working conditions, interpersonal relationships being managed, so all of the current policies and the changes of law on bullying, harassment, discrimination, um, and then obviously money, security, and a certain amount of status, so that a title. That is the mandatory checklist of starting to bring on team members into your organisation, and I would even argue that it's important for contractors or freelance people that are helping you. Then when we switch to the other side and talk about motivators, people need, this is what the humans, if you like, that are working with you need, they need to feel a sense of achievement. And so as, a, as you make that leap, and it's a long answer to a question, I apologise, as we, as we make that leap across, then we're looking for acknowledgement to give our people a sense of achievement, that they've got recognition for their accomplishments, that they are doing challenging work. Most people, when you talk to them, are like, oh, I'm really super excited about this new role because I'm going to learn heaps. And so giving them challenging work to do. Uh, not everybody is there to just peel potatoes every day for three years. So it's really about you know, starting to think about, you know, if you're going to put people through a restaurant or hospitality environment, giving them challenging things to do, increasing over time their responsibility and growth and development. And so, um, again, you know, we haven't got time to kind of do the deep dive, but as you make that leap, self-awareness as we said and then starting to look at okay i'm becoming a leader what are my responsibilities as a ceo if you like excellent so more questions yeah well, yes <laughs> go ahead go ahead so in regards to growing your current revenue streams how do you help drive your sales team to understand slash change their mindset to match the outcomes you need to get to the next level that uh, setting kpis and consequences have been a challenge to manage since the pandemic that's a great question. Um, there's, there's two parts to that. So there's the first is, which is how do we motivate and grow our sales team to kind of stretch, if you like. Um, and then the second part is building your organization and operating your organization within its, um, within its own means, if you like. Um, and so I see every single day that organizations are trying to constantly grow revenue and grow sales. We need more sales, we need more revenue. But I see a lot of wastage, um, you know, out, you know, when I go behind the scenes. And so you, you have to, I can teach you how to, and, and I'll talk about it quickly because I know you want to answer that question, talk to you about how to motivate and grow and have a sales team excelling. But if anybody in the organisation can see 
that there is um, uh, a delusional expectation in terms of what the revenue and sales needs to be and or wastage, uh, it will erode anything that you do to motivate that sales team. Okay, um, I am a huge advocate for a, quite a crazy person. His name is Jordan Belfort. He wrote a great book called um, The Way of the Wolf. Uh, there's, by the way, there's the movie, The Wolf of Wall Street. His book on selling is absolutely incredible. So it's the, the question is, how do we motivate our sales team? Understand that there are three parts to a sale. That obviously, a sale opens and closes. So we bring in a lead and we get an opportunity and we put that all the way through our, whatever our process might be to actually get a revenue, like money in the door. Let's not talk about a sale that's an agreement or a contract. Let's talk about the actual cash in, in the door. It's open to close. As we move through that journey with a customer, the very first question is ethically, can I give the customer the benefit that they're looking for? The benefit that I'm looking for when I take my dog to the groomer is a fluffy, clean, cuddly, happy little dog. I'm not looking for a beautiful fit out. I'm not looking for a groomer that you know is well presented. I'm not looking for parking out the front. Maybe I am looking for parking out the front so I can get a drop <laughs> off quickly. But but I'm I'm I as the customer have got a hundred dollars and I'm looking for a fluffy, beautiful puppy dog. That's the benefit I'm looking for. I'm not looking for the lights, the color, the time, the features, the website, the social media. I'm not looking for any of that. I, I, and so I think we fall in, the first thing we do is we fall into the trap of focusing too much on the features. Yeah. So when we're moving through that sales process, there's three things that your salespeople and including yourself need to do. There's, there's three things you're selling, if you like. The first thing is the product or service. And you're educating the customer on how when they hand over their money, they can see that they're 100% without a doubt going to get the benefit that they're looking for. So the salesperson has to ethically be very aware and have the conversation with the customer about what the clear benefit that the customer is looking for. Not talk, just get sharp and throw up about the features. The second sale is that, um, so it's th that the product or service will meet the benefit requirements of what the clients, the customer is looking for. The second is that the salesperson is selling themselves on a scale of zero to 10, how much does a customer trust them? And so the salesperson has to build trust with the customer. And then the third sale that's happening is the brand or company. And so we, you know, in, in an age of a lot of internet traffic and, and, and social media and digital presence, that the brand, it's important to brand. So what Jordan Belfort talks about in his book is that you, we've got to take each of those three sales, the product or service, the salesperson and the company from a zero to a 10 three scores on that line, when the customer is at 10 on each of those, the customer will say, this is a no brainer, I'll pay you any money you ask. Mm. So I think it's a really great simple system to say, we, we jump too quickly into, these are all the amazing features of my products. Um, but in that famous quote by Steve Jobs, which is what incredible benefit can we give to the customer? I'm gonna give you a thousand songs in your pocket. Yeah. What is it? It's an iPod. And so, you know, and I've, I actually put that quote in this presentation today that, that you know, to motivate our sales team, um, I, I think, what can we do every day is a great question. Um, have your sales team teach other members in the sales team about your products and services and about what you do. And the person that's doing the teaching in a, in a daily sales training session is the person that's doing the learning. Now you're gonna go, oh, I haven't got time for my salespeople to be training every day then you don't have time for your company to succeed. Yeah, so true, because if you're not putting that time and effort in, then how can your team actually meet their, yes. their KPIs yes. that you're setting for them? Yeah. You need to put in the effort as well. You have to put in the effort. And the key thing I said there was have your sales team members train each other. If, if you are just getting up and lecturing and saying, I need these numbers and I need these sales, then that's great. They understand you know, the, the, <laughs> that's you the, know, the destination on the yeah. map. But what we need to be doing on a daily basis is sales team training and, and the, the people that speak the most in those presentations and teach about products and services will be the ones doing all of the learning. I've got another very practical question. Awesome. Which is from Annette. She says, I understand that after 15 years of continuously owning a business and if you're over 55 years old, the sale can be exempt from capital gains tax. Do you know if 15 years is counted by the year or the exact month of when the business was started? I'm trying to work through the timing of selling my business. Um, that question, I'm just gonna put a disclaimer and say is best asked of your accountant. Um, 
the evidence I will be looking for is the registration certificate of your proprietary limited. Um, it is one of the reasons for um, setting up a proprietary limited and um, many people have been told to you know, stay a sole trader, it's much cheaper each year. Um, but it, it, it is the capital gains tax legislation or part of the Australian Tax Act that says that particular asset classes are exempt from uh, or discounted. Um, and so many businesses that are sold because they've been proprietary limited, I'm going to say it's a share transaction. If that asset, like a house, like an investment property or mm. investment unit or house, um, or a, a business, or shares in a business are an asset, um, after, an, after 12 months, there's a 50% capital gains tax discount. And then within the capital gains tax provisions, specifically selling businesses, uh, there, are, there are those provisions. So the first and easiest way to answer that question is, if you are a proprietary limited, it will be the date of your certificate, will say the month and the year that your company was registered. As far as a sole trader is concerned or a partnership under the Corporations Act, I would be asking the question of your accountant uh, or more importantly, educating yourself on how to read the tax act. It's pretty simple. Um, and so if I had a moment, I could Google very quickly and probably find uh, within the, the either uh, legislation.gov.au website uh, or via your accountant, go right in and read the, the part and section of the legislation so that you can you know, get clear advice directly from, the, from, from, you know, from your computer screen. Mm. Now, Adam is asking, how do you check that your business is conforming to law in terms of being ready to sell? <laughs> that <laughs> um, sounds like that's, a, um, that's a, a can of that question. <laughs> it is. Um, look, uh, um, there's no easy way to answer that question. Um, you do need, as a, as a business leader and a business owner, you know, it's your responsibility, particularly if you're proprietary limited as a director, um, under the Corporations Act, you know, you, if you are a proprietary limited and you're the director of the company, you have responsibilities in the Corporations Act uh, to ensure that you are aware of updates to legislation and changes. And that's not just financial, uh, it's occupational health and safety, um, it's human resources and, and industrial relations uh, and any requirements or codes of practice and requirements of your particular industry. Um, and that is, you know, um, that is a big job um, uh, prior to you know, the, the sale transaction that I did, I had a full-time manager uh, just managing that compliance, you know, on a $120,000 a year package. Mm. Um, and so, the, you know, obviously the bigger, as your organisation grows, um, you know, we weren't far off uh, requiring full-time legal counsel in-house. In so I, I think um, one of the things I've done personally from day one in business is have a commercial lawyer, um, you know, on speed dial. And there's, there's plenty of lawyers out there that the more that you work with them, the cheaper they get, um, particularly if they have got an expectation that they know that they're going to hear from you every couple of months and they're going to get a couple of hours worth of work, you'll get very reasonable rates um, and great advice. So I think, um, you know, and if you're going to sell your business anyway, absolutely have a lawyer helping you. So, um, and, and, and that's something that, you know, there's plenty of great people out there. Make sure that lawyer, when you're interviewing lawyers like you would interview a staff member, make sure that lawyer has been involved in business transactions they'll be able to tell you straight away, underprivileged, whether you've got any areas that you need to address. Yeah. Um, I can't believe that we've only got about 10 minutes left. <laughs> so, this is great. This is awesome. Um, Liz is asking, how would you highlight your brand worth when selling a business? Look, that's a great, um, that's an excellent question. The buyer will do that themselves. Yeah. So... Um, what about trust scores and things like that? Um, look, there's, there's definitely... There are very mechanical industry accepted ways to do it, like TripAdvisor, for example. How many reviews on TripAdvisor? What star rating have you got? Um, I would suggest that you know anything less than a thousand reviews on Google or TripAdvisor is kind of you know the system is doing that brand for you, that brand work for you. Uh, particularly in an age now where we have you know th there's young people that have been working for me that they don't do anything unless it's got a great review. You know, they won't go to a restaurant or a, or a place unless it's got lots of reviews. So the little startup businesses really struggle. Mm. Um, and so I thought brand awareness and, and, and brand value was really important um, in, a, in a sale transaction that I went through, um, you know, 2021 to 2022. Um, but the buyers were just interested in revenue, profit, and they didn't really connect um, you know, of, of that business that I advised, they didn't really connect the brand value, although there was a very strong brand. So it does come back to you have to run the narrative of how that brand value drives leads, drives sales, drives 
Maybe you're more profitable than your competitors in your industry, and that is the true financial measure of brand. Because remember, we're talking about selling a business, which is actually a financial transaction. And as much as we'd love to say, you know, my brand is worth a lot, you, you can, when they say, where do you get your leads or your customers or where does your, where does your traffic come from? You say, well, it's, it's this organic reach on social media, for example, from our brand. Yeah. Um, so your book, How to Build a, a Business um, Others Want to Buy. Yes. So what are some key factors then that make a business more sought after than others? Yeah, look, I think there's a, there's a number of things. Um, years of success is very, very helpful. So, um, you know, when we take our money, say, say we sell our business and we go to invest in something and say it's the stock market, well, we, we've kind of made all this money. We want, to go, we want it to be safe. So we're going to invest in a blue chip company. Why are they blue chip? Because they've been around a long time. They're really well run. Uh, they, they are um, predictable. And so evidence of trading history is, is kind of number one. Um, and so a business that's been around for maybe, you know, a year uh, is going to be a struggle because it hasn't got predictable. So it's going to be a much bigger sell, if you like, uh, to, get, to get the message across. So solid, predictable results. Um, when you're dealing with, um, you know, professionals that are professional business buyers, they look at lots of businesses and they can tell pretty quickly whether a business is, you know, whether it's got lots of hiccups in it or whether it's kind of ticking along um, and potentially, you know, you know, that, that's probably number one. Number two is outlook. Um, and really understanding is your marketplace that you're trading in your product or service something that's growing and expanding? Is it something that's like level and it's kind of just built into society? Mm. Or is it declining? And, and so if it is declining, then what is the alternative that, that, the, that the general public buying public are moving towards? Can you innovate in that direction? So I think outlook is obviously really important. But equally important is like the last three years of trading history. If you haven't got three tax returns that are, which show profit on the bottom line, it's going to be a struggle. So, you know, it's it's. I don't want to give anyone the illusion that it's super easy, although it is very rewarding. That focus on having a good, solid, repeatable profit three years in a row, mm -hmm. and then you will have something that's worth money, like real money. And um, you, you talked about uh, economic uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So obviously there is a great amount of economic uncertainty at the moment. Yes. How can businesses build their resilience to make sure that they're going to make it over this latest hurdle and yep. be in a position where they can sell? Or if they're already thinking uh, um, in dire straits already, how can they sell their business and yep. still turn a profit on it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I think... Um my, my, in my situation, I've had a bunch of great mentors. Um, and one of those mentors has been through a dozen, probably not a dozen, probably it's less than a dozen, maybe five significant economic cycles. And so the first thing is understand it's a cycle. Um, the second piece of advice that he gave me, which is probably, you know, resounds with me every single day, is that in any climate, whether it's the current climate or the previous climate, there are, but there are businesses doing really, really well, a third of them, in fact, a third kind of just ticking along and a third going backwards. Ironically, right before COVID, my business was really finish, feeling the pain. Mm. So the business I was running was really struggled when there was a lot of economic activity and then goes really well when there's not and it's in uncertain times. Mm. And so it's doing really well. And so I think that... Um, you know, without kind of saying, you know, we're, we're in the business, obviously, of, of educating people publicly in the media, but we need to be mindful of the data we're consuming. And I think that we're wasting a lot of energy and effort on unnecessary data, the inputs, particularly from, you know, negative media sources, for example, that maybe have a conflict of interest to sell advertising, um, <laughs> you know, and so, um, you know, and so they're trying to keep your attention and it's easy to keep people's attention on negative uh, information. So I don't want to kind of dig too deep into that, but be, be really conscious of the media sources that you're consuming because I think that we are in an age when we have had the best opportunities ever for business. Mm. And I think if you just knuckle down and focus on your customer and what your customer is looking for and what your customer is going to exchange money for, then, then they, will, they will be there in very, you know, even if we've got to get through this little hurdle, they're going to be right there ready to go straight after it. And so now's the time to educate and learn and contract your resource consumption so that you're lean, so that you can come out of this and explode into the future. Mm. Um, I have a huge amount of hope for a lot of people because I think we're past the low point. I think we're now just in the rebuilding phase. 
Uh, I don't, you know, yes, I've seen cycles before and I think we've got some challenges to manage, but I think the challenges right now is that a lot of businesses aren't as lean as they should be and we've got the opportunity to kind of tighten up right now uh, and then move forward. Yeah. I've only got time for one more question. <laughs> wow. I can't believe it. You yeah. didn't even get no, through no, the whole okay. presentation. Yeah, plenty there. We'll, we'll circulate the presentation. <laughs> so Bill is asking, what are the pros and cons of using a business broker? And how do you pick a good one to sell your business? So apply the principles of you're looking for an amazing team member for your team. And a business broker is a team member. It's just for a different game. You're going onto a different field to play a different team. Um, I think there are advantages in having anyone with experience that they have done it numbers of times at anything involved in your team, whether it's a lawyer, an accountant or a business broker. So interview them, um, talk to them about what success looks like for you um, and interview a number of them. And you know, lots of people ask me about real estate and buying houses. I'm like, go and look at 12. So go and talk to 12 business brokers and you will struggle to find 12 great ones and you'll get a better feel for the market. I think the biggest mistake you can make is kind of, you know, talking to the business broker that you meet at the business networking breakfast that you go to every Wednesday. Um, expand your horizons and be, you know, uh, intelligently skeptical about what they're saying and about expectations on price. And if that business broker gives you advice on the styling that you could do to your business, like selling a house, you know, people now are paying professional stylists you know, thousands of dollars to get the cushions and the furniture and that kind of stuff. If that business broker can give you some advice on cost effective styling or, or tweaking of your business over the next say six months, mm -hmm. um, and that they can then say, well, you know, over the next six months, I think if you did these couple of things to your business, we can target this kind of buyer and that kind of buyer has a, has a higher price mm -hmm. tolerance, then that's the kind of person that you're looking for. I definitely think having someone with experience on your team is the way to go. If that person's labeled them themselves as a broker, great. A broker will be specifically looking for a commission on the sale. Mm. So um, you may be better off, you know, spending that commission and prospecting yourself. You've been selling your products and services to customers. You're just gonna sell another product, which is your business, to another customer. You're great at selling. Um, so just consider that you don't, it, it's not essential, good idea, but not essential. Where would you take it to though if you were going, if you were considering doing it yourself? Like how, say you were a cafe and you're like, oh, yeah, look, I've got I, a great little cafe, I want to sell it. Don't yeah, look, I think, um, yeah, 100%. So if you've got a great little cafe and you want to sell it, um, just look at what, have a look at the business brokers and look at how they do it. Often they're just good at writing an ad and placing an ad and often it's on somewhere like Facebook Marketplace or Gumtree. Um, really? 100%, 100%. <laughs> so, so and, and I guess the other like little hack that I can quickly give you because I know we're tight for time is pretend you're going to buy a cafe. So pretend that you've got money and start prospecting, start looking. Because don't forget that, you know, a lot of people go, oh, I'm going to sell my business. But what if you were actually to say, you know what, actually I'm going to go and buy a couple of businesses. Because if I go and buy a couple of businesses that are seller funded, then I can actually afford to employ a general manager and I can do the thing I'm passionate about, which is food and coffee. Mm. And I could actually have a bunch of cafes because that will educate you because you'll start thinking like a buyer and you'll know what you value. And often what you value is what another buyer values. And it's a great lesson. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kobe. <laughs> That's I can't okay. believe that we've run out of time. And so thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I hope that you gained some valuable insights. Thanks to our fantastic guest, Kobe. If you want to find out more about Kobe and how he can help you, then you should head to kobisimat.com, K-O-B-I-S-I-M-M-A-T.com. And of course, you can also buy his book, which is called How to Build a Business Others Want to Buy, and it's available in bookstores all over the place. Also get it online. Yeah, Don't it's hesitate on to buy right it. Now. Yeah, yeah, there's lots, there's lots, lots more tips in there, lots of practical stuff about, you know, business momentum and he's got a whole formula and there's spread like little sheets and everything for you to go through. And uh, if you're after more business advice or small business inspiration, then head to our website, which is koshisbusinessbuilders.com.au. Thanks for joining us. Bye.